Uh, if we connect a wire from one end of the battery to the other, a uh, copper wire has a low electrical resistance. That means it doesn't resist or hinder these charges from moving. And so these positive charges start to move through the wire. Now in reality, we now know that it's really the negative charged electrons that are moving towards the positive end. But when they set up the rules of electricity, they say positive moves to negative. It really doesn't matter what's moving. The point is something's moving. Electrical charges are moving. And this movement of electrical charges is called an electrical current. So an electrical current is the movement of electrical charges. There is an electrical current. <clears throat> and in fact, these electrical charges are so excited the positives are so excited about going to where those cute little negative charges are that if you uh, were to put a little flashlight uh, light bulb here, if you made the electrical charges go through this filament in this light bulb, it would cause it to glow. You don't have to know that, but that's anyhow. That, that's called performing work because it's just uh, it's trying to these electrical charges want to get from one end to the other end. So when they go through this tungsten wire loop, it glows as they move to, uh, in the direction they want to. Now, uh, let me just uh, re, uh, redraw this. Actually, you have a picture of what I've just done on page 37. It was a Duracell battery. Uh, it doesn't have to be a Duracell. If we put a voltmeter, uh, let's say this is a voltmeter. A voltmeter is a device used to measure the voltage of a battery. It's uh, basically a battery tester. And uh, what, they, what we do is we take on a voltmeter, we've got uh, usually a little probe, and we can put uh, uh, one probe at one end of the battery and the other probe at the uh, opposite end of the battery. These uh, probes are also known as electrodes. That's an electrode. And what the battery tester does is it tells us how big of a difference there is in the electrical polarity between this end and this end of the battery. So it measures the difference in electrical polarity. Measures the difference in electrical polarity. Another way of saying that is the difference in voltage, the difference in electrical potential. All right, now, uh, does anybody know uh, how, what the normal voltage is of the most common batteries? Yeah. And, and, in other words, uh, some of you have a, a double A battery. Right, anybody use double A's? Uh, triple A's, a C, a D, they are all the same voltage. Does anybody know what it is? It's 1.5 volts. Now they do make little 9 volt batteries. That's what I'm actually using. I'm using a little, in my microphone, this is a 9 volt. But most batteries that go in, light, in uh, flashlights and most electronic devices are 1.5 volts. So uh, let's say this started out, this is a 1.5 volt battery. Okay. Let's say it's a 1.5 uh, volt battery, it doesn't really matter. If we were monitoring this difference in electrical polarity, and if we've got the wire connected, maybe it's a flashlight, we've got the flashlight turned on, what do you think's happening to the voltage of this battery as the uh, positive charges are moving towards the negative charges? What's happening to the voltage? It's decreasing. Everybody knows that as you use a battery, it starts to go from green, really good, and then it starts to head towards yellow, and then it goes to red. The voltage is dropping. Because why? Because these positive charges are moving towards these cute little negative charges. But the point is, is that we're losing that difference in electrical polarity. And as we lose the difference in electrical polarity, we're, another way of saying that is the voltage is decreasing. Is everybody okay on that? So uh, the, eventually a battery goes dead. And if you want to, if you have a rechargeable battery, and I just got some of these new rechargeable 9 volts, 
So then you use the power of uh, electrical power to re-separate those charges. They don't want to be separated, but we can force them to. And that powers, uh, recharges the battery right back up again. And then once we start connecting it and using it, it d d discharges again. We've been talking about three electrical concepts. We've been talking about what is an electrical potential or voltage. That's a separation of opposite electrical charges. That's what we find in a battery, a separation of opposite electrical charges, and that's why there's a voltage, a difference in electrical polarity. We've explained what an electrical current is. You'd say, what's that? It's when electrical charges move. When these electrical charges are moving, that's called an electrical current. And we've used the term electrical resistance. A resistance is what prevents or hinders uh, an electrical current. It hinders the flow of electrical charges. <clears throat> if you increase electrical resistance, you reduce electrical current. If you reduce electrical resistance, you increase electrical current. So those of you who had physics, you learned something called Ohm's law. And Ohm's law simply takes these three concepts and uh, uh, basically creates a relationship between these three concepts. The electrical current is equal to the voltage divided by resistance. All right, and like any good formula, if you know any two, you can solve for the third, right? So if you know voltage and resistance, you can calculate the current. If you knew current and resistance, you can multiply current times resistance and determine the voltage. All right, that's called Ohm's law. So uh, that's just a, a relationship. Now, what's this got to do with neurophysiology? Well, it actually is even broader than neurophysiology. In the 1940s, in the 1940s, two very uh, 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 historically important individuals named Hodgkin and Huxley. You don't have to know that. Hodgkin and Huxley were actually trained, they are British, and they were trained as electrical engineers. And what they did, it was actually during World War II, is they were the first ones to insert a microelectrode into a cell and measure the electrical voltage of a cell. They had speculated that cells had an electrical voltage, but they had never been able to measure it. So here's what they did, Hodgkin and Huxley in the 1940s. They took a voltmeter. This is the voltmeter. This is the battery tester. Now, uh, this was a cell, and they actually, the cells they used, it's not really important which cells, but they actually used neurons from a squid, which were very large nerve cells. And uh, the, uh, there's, of course, there's the fluid on the inside of the cell. And in order to keep the cell alive, they had the cell surrounded by fluid. So there was the ICF, the intracellular fluid, and the ECF, the extracellular fluid, to keep the cell alive. And the big breakthrough that Hodgkin and Huxley did in the 1940s, they, they had voltmeters, but what they were able to create was really small microelectrodes. They actually called them microelectrodes. They were so small that they could insert this microelectrode into a cell without destroying the cell. And uh, I'm old enough to actually be very familiar with this because when I was doing my research in the early 18th century, that was in the 1970s, actually what I did was electrophysiology. That's exactly what I did, is put microelectrodes into cells. So uh, they're very small and you pop them in. And what they did is they had one electrode they inserted into the cell and the other electrode was in the fluid outside of the cell. And they wanted to see is there a difference in electrical polarity between the inside and outside of the cell? This is exactly like saying, is there a difference in electrical polarity between this side of the battery and that side? Is there a difference in electrical polarity between the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell? Well, they did it, and indeed they found there was a voltage. The voltage is approximately 70 millivolts, 70, 80, or 90 millivolts, negative on the inside, positive on the outside, meaning there are more negative charges on the inside of the cell than positive, and there are more positive charges on the outside of the cell than negative. 
So just like the battery above, where the battery had more positive charges at this end and more negative charges at this end, all right, so there's more positive charges on the outside of a cell and more negative charges on the inside. We have said that when there's a difference in electrical polarity, that's called a voltage, an electrical potential difference. And the size of this voltage is about 70, 80, or 90 millivolts, depending upon which cell you measure it in. Now, this voltage has been found to exist in every cell of every living organism. It's not just found in nerve cells. It is found in plant cells. It's found in bacterial cells. It's found in skin cells. We call this voltage, this is called the resting cell membrane voltage or cell membrane potential. That's what we call it. <clears throat> it's found in every living cell. Now it's called the uh, cell membrane potential. Potential means voltage. Electrical potential is a voltage. It's called cell membrane because this difference in electrical polarity exists across the cell membrane. On one side of the cell membrane, it's positive, and on the other side, it's negative. So that's why it's called cell membrane voltage, cell membrane potential. Now, why they say it's resting is because in some cells, specifically excitable cells, nerve and muscle cells, this voltage can change. In other cells, in non-excitable cells, it doesn't change. It stays constant. But in excitable cells, nerve and muscle, it can change. So uh, this is called the resting cell membrane potential. <clears throat> we'll learn what happens when it changes in an excitable cell. Now, uh, for, before I go any further, uh, they usually write it minus 70 because they're trying to indicate that the inside of the cell is polarized negative, the outside is positive. And since it's the cell that we're interested in, not the outside of the cell, they write it minus 70. It's saying that the inside is 70 millivolts more negative, negatively polarized than the outside. Now, second point, what is 70 millivolts? Is that big? Is that small? We had said up here that a typical flashlight battery, a AA, AAA, C, a D, are 1.5 volts. Let's uh, understand this. Uh, one volt, one volt, well, a thousand millivolts is equal to one volt. Now you should understand that. You'd say, what do you mean? Because you know the metric system. We know that one meter, a thousand millimeters is one meter. A thousand milligrams is one gram. A thousand milliliters is one liter. A thousand milliseconds is one second. And a thousand millivolts is one volt. Is everybody okay on that? So it takes a thousand millivolts to make one volt. Now, uh, so uh, if this, uh, let's just say, what if, let me round this number off. Since the cells are about 70, 80, 90 millivolts, let me round that up to about 100 millivolts. Most cells are less than 100 millivolts, but let's say it's up close to 100 millivolts. So 100 millivolts would be how many volts? 100 millivolts is how many volts? 0.1. In other words, just as 1,000 uh, milligrams is one gram, 100 milligrams is a tenth of a gram. Just as 1,000 milliseconds is one second, 100 milliseconds is a tenth of a second. It all works the same. You're just moving the decimal point three places to the left. So if the cells, if we said they're about 100 millivolts, they're a little bit less than a tenth of a volt. So is that a lot or a little? Well, a tenth of a volt is small. It's much smaller than a flashlight battery, which is 1.5 volts. However, I just said that every cell in your body has this voltage. So multiply that number, 0.1, times 60 trillion. The amount of electrical energy in our body is amazing. This electrical energy in our body is the basis of powering our nervous system, our muscles, and the electrical activity of our heart. 
And this is what they monitor when they monitor, do electrocardiogram recordings, electromyogram recordings, electroencephalogram recordings. These are recordings of the electrical energy of our body. So we have an extraordinary amount of electrical energy that we can draw upon. Okay, this is really a, a, a form of energy that's used by the body. So what, now that we've got a sense of the, even though each cell is just a tenth of a volt, there's a lot of cells. So now what we want to try to understand is what's the basis for this voltage? Where does it come from? Where does the voltage come from? <clears throat> so uh, the, uh, how do I explain this? We're going to explain it in steps. And uh, this is always a part. It's not that complicated, but students somehow uh, always get a little confused. So the first step in understanding where this voltage comes from in every cell of your body uh, right here is, first of, off, we remember that the, the electrolytes that are found inside the cell are significantly different than the electrically charged chemicals outside the cell. The two most important electrolytes in your body are potassium and sodium. And the, of the two, potassium is the single most important electrolyte. Now, what's the normal concentration of uh, potassium on the inside of the cell? Uh, about 150 milliequivalents per liter. You'd say, should we know that? Yeah, I think so. Uh, the normal potassium on the outside of the cell, it's not zero, it's low. It's five milliequivalents per liter. You must know that. You must know that one. That one you got to know. Absolutely. Now, in fact, it's a little bit less than five. I'm rounding it up. It's really closer to four, but five is an easy number to remember. That's the normal potassium level in the extracellular fluid, ECF. Now, what, uh, uh, the uh, sodium is the second major electrolyte, important electrolyte. The normal sodium level in the extracellular fluid is 150 milliequivalents per liter, and you must know that. And the normal sodium level inside the cell is about 15 milliequivalents per liter. If you know it, good, and if you don't, that's okay too. All right, so you, we notice it's not that uh, clearly most of the potassium is inside the cell, but there is a little bit outside. Clearly, most of the sodium is outside the cell, but there is a little bit on the inside. Now, we had learned this earlier. In fact, we learned this. You need to know this part for the test on Monday. Because we had learned, back on page, just to remind you, section C, near the beginning of section C, page C5, on C5, just to remind you, because this we need to know for the test, we had learned most of the potassium is inside the cell, most of the sodium is outside, and the actual numbers were on C4. The actual numbers were on page C4. And what does it show is the actual amount of potassium on the inside of the cell, 140 milliequivalents per liter. What's the actual potassium in the uh, tissue fluid or blood plasma? About four or five milliequivalents per liter. Those are the actual numbers. And you can see for sodium. So what I did is I took these numbers and I rounded them off to make them easier to remember. All right? And so that's what I gave you on the page we were just on, the bottom of 37. So on the bottom of page 37, where we were just on, that's what I rounded off. Now, here's the question. Okay, fine. There's a, most of the potassium is uh, inside the cell. Most of the sodium is outside. Why? How come most of the potassium is inside? How did it get there? Why isn't there a lot of sodium on the inside? Because we are reminded of the sodium-potassium ATP pump. We talked about active transport. Let's go back to that page. This is near the end of section B. This is page B28. And on B28, we were reviewing active transport. And one of the most important active transport mechanisms in every cell of your body, 
and in fact in every cell of every living organism, in plant cells, in bacterial cells, is the sodium potassium ATP pump. It uses ATP to pump sodium out of the cell and at the same time pump potassium in. So this active transport mechanism concentrates potassium on the inside of the cell and concentrate sodium on the outside of the cell. That's why all, most of the potassium ends up on the inside and most of the sodium ends up on the outside because of the sodium-potassium pump. Th what I'm describing right now is classic physiology. This is a major subject in this course, believe it or not. It doesn't sound like it would be, but it is. Uh, we had mentioned on page B29, the very next page, when we're talking about active transport, that active transport accounts for 40% of all the energy used by the cells of your body. And the very first examples I gave is active transport of sodium and potassium. This accounts for almost half of the energy used by the cells of your body. So it's whatever the hell this is, whatever it means, it must be important. And it is the basis of creating this difference in concentration of sodium and potassium between the inside and outside cell. Now, I said that I, on page 37, we said we wanted you for sure to know these numbers. And your first thought is, okay, so I got a crazy fanatic physio teacher. I don't understand why I need to know those numbers. Look on the next page. <clears throat> on the next page, on page 38, page 38, this is that lab form, another lab form I stole. <clears throat> it's from Brotman Medical Center, but we could use a lab form <clears throat> from Kaiser or Cedar sinai or any of them. This is where they measure the chemicals in the blood. So they measure the sodium and potassium levels in your blood, which is an extracellular fluid. The normal sodium level in your blood is 135 to 155 milliequivalents per liter. The number that I just told you to remember on the previous page, what did I tell you to memorize? The normal sodium level in the extracellular fluid, 150. Is it fair to say that the, if the normal range is 135 to 155, it's approximately 150 milliequivalents per liter? So but we just asked you to memorize what the normal sodium level is in your blood and all the other extracellular fluids. In tissue fluid, in cerebrospinal fluid, in all extracellular fluids. The normal potassium level in your blood and other extracellular fluids ranges between 3.6 and 5.5. It's really closest to about 4. But the number that I asked you to memorize on the previous page was 5 milliequivalents per liter. These are really important. Every nurse, every single nurse knows these numbers. Honest, they really do. That's how important they are. If anybody has worked in a hospital setting, they are always checking the potassium electrolyte levels. Because as we're going to learn, the potassium levels determine the electrical voltage of every cell in your body. That's what potassium determines, the electrical voltage of every cell. So of the two electrolytes, they're both important, but the most important is potassium, absolutely the most important. <clears throat> now, we understand why, why there's a high amount of potassium on the inside and a high amount of sodium on the outside, sodium, potassium, ATP pump. Uh, now, another thing in understanding this voltage, the cell membrane. We know that the cell membrane is described as being <coughs> semi-permeable. The cell membrane is said to be semi-permeable. What does semi-permeable mean? It means that it's permeable to some chemicals and not so permeable to others. I know you might be saying, I can't look at it. Who, who would understand that? All right, semi-permeable. 
it means that the cell membrane is more permeable to some chemicals than others. Now, in terms of electrolytes, you'll remember, and we need to know this for the test on Monday, there are ion channels. There are separate sodium ion channels, separate potassium ion channels, separate chloride ion channels. That's why we talked about it. This is all going to be important. Normally, all of those ion channels are normally closed, except for the potassium ion channels. So the sodium ion channels are normally closed. Now remember, there's a high concentration of sodium in the extracellular fluid. There is a low concentration of sodium in the inside of the cell. The sodium would like to flow or diffuse into the cell, but the sodium ion channels are normally closed. So I drew a dashed line indicating sodium would like to flow in down its concentration gradient, but it can't get through the cell membrane because the sodium ion channels are normally closed. Not only are the sodium ion channels closed, but so are most of the other ion channels. Now, to represent the negative charges on the inside and outside of the cell, I just wrote A minus. A stands for anions, negative charges. The, what is, does anybody remember, what is the major negative charge Chloride. chemical in the extracellular fluid? Chloride. Chloride. We learned it on page C5. Chlorine. So there's a lot of negative charge chlorine in the outside of the cell. It would like to flow in, but the chloride ion channels are normally closed. What's the major source of negativity on the inside of the cell? Protein, negatively charged protein. We learned that on C5 and C4. So uh, there's also negative charge phosphate, but the major source is negative charge protein. For sure, proteins are too big to get across cell membranes. Even though the negative charge chlorine would like to go in, negative charge protein would like to go out, they can't, get, they can't move. The only ion channels that are normally open are potassium ion channels. And potassium tends to diffuse out of the cell. Now, why would potassium tend to flow out? Because there's a higher concentration of potassium inside than outside the cell and the ion channel is wide open. As the potassium ions diffuse out of the cell, as the potassium diffuses out of the cell due to the concentration difference, this is my little symbol for delta, the delta is the difference, okay? The inside of the cell becomes negatively polarized. We're gonna look at 40A. 40A, and it looks like this. Let's imagine we had a cell, and it started out with 100 positive charged potassiums on the inside and 100 negative charged chemicals also on the inside. Okay? We don't care what they are, but they're mostly protein. All right? So if there's 100 positive charges on the inside and 100 negative charges, is it electrically neutral? Yeah, it's, ba it's in balance. Let's say on the outside of the cell, there's 100 sodium, positive charged sodiums, and there's 100 negative charges. They're probably chloride. Okay, not that it matters. Is that electrically neutral? Yeah. All right, so this is electrically neutral on the outside, electrically neutral on the inside. There is no difference in electrical polarity between the inside and outside of the cell. There is no electrical polarity. Is everybody okay on that? Yeah. Now, so the ions are located inside and outside as shown. Now, Imagine, imagine, given, only potassium can move. So even though there's a concentration gradient for sodium to go in, it can't. And these guys might want to move, but they can't. The only one that can move is potassium. So let me draw a potassium ion, and there's an open potassium ion channel. What is potassium going to do? It's going to flow out of the cell. Is that okay? Why is it going out of the cell? Because there's a higher concentration of potassium inside than outside. There's 100 potassiums inside. There's zero outside. Is that a difference in concentration? 
So what do we call it when a chemical diff flows from an area of higher to lower concentration? Diffusion. diffusion. It's diffusing. So here's what happens. That potassium flowed out. So now we've got 99 potassiums inside. We had 100. Now we're 99. Because one potassium went out. I want you to notice what's happened. We now have more negative charges than positive charges inside the cell. Does everybody see that? The inside of the cell now has a negative electrical polarity because there's one more negative charge than positive because one positive charge potassium went out. And look what's happened on the outside. We had 100 positive charge sodiums. We still do. And now we've got one positive charge potassium. Isn't that a total of 101 positive charges? But we have only 100 negative charges. Can everybody see that the outside is positive? It's got more positive than negative. That's what creates the electrical polarity. Now, there's still this concentration gradient, right? There's still 99 potassiums inside and only one on the outside. There's still a concentration gradient. So another potassium is going to flow out. Okay, let's show that on the next page. So another potassium diffuses out of the cell down its concentration gradient. So another potassium went out. Now there's only 98 potassiums inside. But we still have the original 100 negative charges in because they can't go anyplace. Can everybody see that every time a positive charge potassium diffuses out of the cell because of its concentration gradient, it makes the inside more negative and it makes the outside more positive. Now, when you learned about diffusion in your biology classes, even when I reviewed diffusion back in section B, we learned that a chemical normally diffuses until it equalizes everywhere. Right? That's not going to happen here. Why not? When you learned about diffusion of oxygen, diffusion of glucose, an oxygen, a carbon dioxide, a glucose molecule does not have an electrical charge. So when oxygens go into the cell, it doesn't affect the electrical polarity of the cell. When carbon dioxide diffuses out of the cell, it doesn't affect the electrical polarity of the cell. When glucose goes in or out, it doesn't affect the electrical polarity. But we're talking about the movement of ions. Ions have an electrical charge. And when they start to flow in a particular direction, first of all, when they flow, that's called an electrical current. The movement of electrical charge is electrical current. And when they move, that causes a change in the total number of positive or negative charges on the inside versus the outside of the cell. So normally, a non-electrically charged chemical diffuses until it equalizes uh, everywhere. If this potassium did not have an electrical charge, if it didn't, then the potassium would diffuse out until we had 50 on the inside and 50 on the outside. Does that make sense? It would if there was no positive ch uh, charge on that potassium, if we started out with 100, we would end up with 50 on the inside and 50 on the outside. Now they're in equal concentration and they would stop flowing. That's not going to happen. You'd say, why not? Because every time a potassium diffuses out of the cell due to its concentration gradient, it creates an increasing electrical gradient in the opposite direction. You'd say, run that past me again. Look, if right now there are 98 potassiums inside, two on the outside, is there still a concentration gradient? Most potassiums are inside, very few on the outside, right? Right. But the inside of the cell has a negative polarity, and the outside has a positive polarity. If you're a positive charge potassium, don't positive charge potassiums want to move towards the negativity? Don't opposites attract? Doesn't a positive charge want to go where all the cute little negative charges are? Do positive charge potassiums want to go where there's an excess of positivity? No. 
So in other words, if I'm a potassium ion, I'm really confused. The concentration gradient wants me to go out, but the electrical attraction is drawing me in. So there are two forces acting on the potassium and not just one. When oxygen diffuses in to a cell, all that matters is the concentration difference. But when potassium is flowing, it depends on both, both the concentration gradient and the electrical gradient. And what we have is the concentration gradient is pushing potassiums out, but the electrical attraction to the negativity is drawing them in. So eventually, the potassiums stop diffusing out of the cell because they will never reach that point where there's 50 on the inside and 50 on the outside because the electrical attraction drawing potassiums back into the cell becomes as strong as the concentration gradient pushing them out. Now, I've tried to explain the, the, how this voltage is created using very simple numbers. 100 potassiums started out on the inside and then some, uh, some of them flowed out and most of them stayed in. What are the real numbers? The real numbers are not the numbers I just gave you. The real numbers, and I'll just say this and we'll take a break. Here's the actual numbers. Most of the potassium is in the cell. It's not 98 potassiums. It's a concentration of 150 milliequivalents per liter. That's the normal concentration of potassium on the inside of the cell. I just said 98 because it was easy to say. This is the real number. Now, the real amount of potassium on the outside of the cell is not two potassiums. It's five milliequivalents per liter. That's the normal potassium level in the blood and extracellular fluids. Now, notice... That we've got sodium ion, I'm sorry, potassium ion channels that are wide open. Most of the potassium is inside the cell. The question is, if there's this big concentration difference where most of the potassium is inside, much less is outside, why aren't all the potassiums continue to float, diffuse out? Because there is an opposite electrical gradient in the opposite direction. Uh, the negative polarity, the negativity on the inside of the cell, how strong is it? It is about 70, 80, or 90 millivolts negative. When the inside of the cell is negative 90 millivolts, that electrical negativity is strong enough to prevent any more potassiums from flowing out due to the concentration gradient. In other words, this concentration gradient pushing potassiums out is balanced by an equally strong electrical gradient drawing them in. So no more potassiums diffuse out of the cell. This state that we're talking about is known as the equilibrium state. It's reached in equilibrium. There are two forces acting on the potassium. There's, let's just say this one more time, then take the break. The concentration gradient is pushing potassiums out. Clearly, most of the potassium is inside the cell, much less is outside. The ion channel, the potassium ion channel is wide open. Why aren't the potassiums going out? Because the inside of the cell has a negative polarity. And that's strong enough to prevent any more potassiums from going out because they're drawn electrically in due to the negativity. So we have two opposing forces. A concentration gradient is pushing potassium out, and an electrical gradient is drawing them in, and they stop moving. And so that's the, this is voltage. is called the resting cell membrane potential. I had mentioned during the, uh, uh, before the break, that, you know, we talked about, this is page B25, not that you have to go to it. We, we talked about diffusion, oxygen diffusing into the cell and carbon dioxide diffusing out of the cell. 
And we, uh, of course, when oxygen goes in, that doesn't change the electrical <coughs> polarity of the cell. If carbon dioxide diffuses out, that doesn't change the electrical polarity of the cell. Why not? Because oxygen is not an ion. Carbon dioxide is not an ion. The total number of oxygens or carbon dioxides inside or outside of the cell doesn't create an electrical polarity in the cell. It does, it's not a positive or a negative charge carbon dioxide molecule. So when you learned in biology and microbiology about chemicals diffusing in and out, you didn't deal with ions. You didn't talk about ions. But in physiology, we do. Because it is these ions, or in medicine, known as electrolytes that are responsible for the electrical activity of the cells of our body. And so if you've got positive charged potassium ions flowing out of the cell, then that's changing the total number of positive and negative charges on the inside versus the outside. So that's why when you've got ions going in or out, that is affecting the electrical polarity. I might also mention, if we, uh, and just to look at a picture on page 41, page 41, uh, there are really a whole bunch of different electrolytes we know inside and outside of the cell. And if, if all of these ions could, were free to go in or out, however they wanted, then there would be also no electrical polarity. Because if the potassium simply wanted to equalize between the inside and outside of the cell, and the sodiums, if the sodiums could flow in, and just equalize between the inside and outside. Just imagine this. If, if potassium diffused out and, and uh, the negative charge proteins could follow, then for every positive charge potassium that went out, a negative charge protein would follow, and that would not, therefore, there'd be no change in electrical polarity. The reason why we get electrical polarity is because we've got all these different kind of electrically charged chemicals, but only one of them can move. So that means that, that the way one of them moves, which is potassium moving out, is going to affect the total number of positive and negative charges on the inside and outside of the cell. Let's take a look uh, on page 38 again. So page 38, we see that there's these various electrolytes, electrically charged chemicals. All, uh, th the only one that is free to move in or out of the cell because the channels are open are potassium. And as the potassium start to flow out, that it increases the number of positive charges on the outside and makes the total number of positive charges on the inside less than the number of negative charges. So the inside becomes overall negatively polarized. We wrote that the potassium ions will continue to diffuse out of the cell until an electrical gradient develops that it becomes as strong as the concentration gradient. So as I demonstrated before the uh, break, it is the concentration gradient pushing the potassiums out of the cell. But as more and more go out, that creates a negativity on the inside that starts to attract them back in. So they reach a point where they stop flowing out or in. There's, this is called an equilibrium state. This is shown on page 39. This is called an equilibrium or steady state potential. Even though there's still a concentration gradient, most of the potassium is still inside the cell, 150 milliequivalents per liter. There is a little bit of potassium that has diffused out about 5 milliequivalents per liter. But there is an equally strong uh, electrical gradient uh, attracting positive charged potassiums in because the inside of the cell is about minus 70, minus 80, minus 90 millivolts negative on the inside. Uh -uh. So they stop. Overall, there's no further net change or net movement. Uh, now, uh, if, if the no amount of potassium were to, on the outside of the cell, start to increase or decrease, that would change this balance. And potassiums would start to then flow in or out of the cell because it changes in that concentration of potassium on the outside. One of the questions that students commonly have is, well, what about that pump, Professor Fink? Did you tell us that pump, you know, it's kicking potassiums out? I'm sorry, bringing potassiums in and kicking sodiums out? Isn't that going to change all of this? 
Not really. Why not? If the pump, if the pump were only to kick, a br bring one potassium in, and at the same time kick one sodium out, that would not change the electrical polarity. It's simply bringing one positive charge in, in the form of potassium, and at the same time kicking one positive charge sodium out. If it simply exchanges a one positive charge for a different positive charge, the total number of positive charges on the inside and outside didn't change. Now, there is evidence that these pumps may not be a one-for-one -one exchange. So if you've read the book or watched some of the videos, there is some evidence that the pump mechanism may be actually pumping in maybe two potassiums and at the same time kicking out three sodiums. In that case, it would slightly change uh, or affect the electrical polarity. But uh, that's technically called an electrogenic pump. <clears throat> but we'll assume that it's basically a one-for-one -one exchange. And again, to repeat, just bringing one positive charge potassium in and at the same time kicking one positive charge sodium out, that doesn't change the electrical polarity. The electrical polarity is really created by the free movement of potassium down its concentration gradient, affecting the total number of potassiums inside and outside of the cell and creating an electrical polarity. Excuse me. This yep. is the time of the relaxation, right? I mean, this is the... This is the way this equilibrium state exists in all the cells of your body. The only time this changes is in nerve cells and muscle cells. It does not, in liver cells and uh, uh, pancreas cells and skin cells, this is the electrical polarity all the time. All the time. Nerve cells and muscle cells, they're going to change because these other ion channels like sodium can open up. And when those open up, then we start to get movement of ions into the cell that's going to change this electrical polarity. So we're going to get into that. Now, uh, I want to look at the lower half of the page. Now, before you faint, <laughs> I am not going to test you on this. Many of the books have this. Many of the books have this in, in the book. Uh, I'm just going to walk you through this real quickly. I will not t test you on it. You say, well, if you're not testing this, let's just move on. <laughs> Most of us don't like math, but there's some of us who do. I'm not, I'm not even saying it's me. I know that there's some people who actually, if they just see a clear formula, it, they actually understand it better than reading a whole lot or hearing a long lecture. So for the benefit of those small number of people, we're just seeing a precise formula or equation lays this all out, this is for you. And if it helps, great. And if it doesn't help, don't worry about it. I'm not testing you on it. The Nernst equation can t t tell us what the voltage is, what the voltage is uh, for any battery if we're given what the concentrations of the chemicals are in that battery. Different batteries are made up of different chemicals. The actual formula reads voltage is equal to R. You don't have to know any of this. R is Boltzmann's constant, times T, which is the temperature. Now, the temperature of the body is 37 degrees centigrade, divided by Z, which is the valence. Now, the chemical that's moving in a cell battery is potassium, which has a valence of 1. Multiply times F, which stands for Faraday's number. Some of you might vaguely remember Faraday's number is 96,400 coulombs per mole. Anybody remembers that? M multiply times the natural logarithmic difference between the concentration on the uh, inside of the cell of potassium divided by the concentration of potassium on the outside of the cell. All right, now again, I'm not asking anybody to know this. If you actually multiply all these things together, it comes out 60. All right, there's all these numbers, these constants, and you multiply it all out, you get 60. And that also converts a natural logarithm into a regular logarithm. So now it's 60 times the logarithm, the logarithmic difference of the concentration of potassium on the inside divided by the concentration of potassium on the outside. What did we say? And you do need to know this for a second, the second exam. What is the normal potassium level on the inside of cells? 150 milliequivalents per liter. What is it normally in the extracellular fluids, including blood? 5 milliequivalents per liter. Now, what's 5 into 150? 30. All right, so now we have 60 times the logarithm of 30. 
Now, most of you have fancy schmancy calculators, one that's got a log function. You maybe you've never used it. So I promise you, if you type in 3030 and hit log, I promise you 1.477 pops up. So now, 60 times 1.477 is 88.6, and the units are millivolts. In other words, if the concentration of potassium on the inside is 150 and on the outside is 5, the voltage of the cell is going to be about minus 90 millivolts. So this is just mathematical. Now, the importance of this for everybody, for everybody, clearly note, if the concentration of, say, potassium on the extracellular fluid were to change and become either lower or higher, obviously we're going to get a different voltage there, aren't we? So that's why, does the potassium levels, especially in our blood and other extracellular fluid, starts to go up, which we're going to write down in a moment, is called hyperkalemia. Or the potassium levels start to go down in our blood and other extracellular fluid, it's called hypokalemia. That's going to cause a change in the voltage of every cell in the body. That's what we want to talk about now. So I'm not testing you on that formula, but maybe you can just see that with that formula, clearly a change in the concentration of potassiums causes a change in the voltage. 